Good morning. I always start out with the prayer that I use in my own personal life. Thanks be to the Father, who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Wow, isn't that a wonderful thing? Amen. Who has already delivered us from the power of darkness. He's already translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption. What? Through his blood. To the praise of the glory of God's grace, wherein we have been accepted in the Beloved and who we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, and how? According to the riches of God's grace. So today, it might seem like an odd title to some of you, all Israel will have to be a Nathaniel. Hmm, that's interesting. So for Israel to have their kingdom, they're all going to have to be a Nathaniel. They're going to have to be an Israelite without Gaul. And we'll look at that passage in John 1. Every man under his own vine and tree, a fig tree, and we'll look at passage in the Old Testament to see how true that is. And to understand that any time you see the mention of the term fig tree, it always is in reference to the nation Israel. So in light of that, let's go to a passage that we used last week that is important to understand because we're going to show this passage and how it also connects with Romans chapter 11. So go to Ezekiel, chapter 36. It's important, Galen, that you don't go to Isaiah. It won't work. <laughs> yeah. They're both prophets, but <laughs> to what I have to say, it won't work. So in Ezekiel 36, let's start with verse 21. And listen very carefully, please. I love how God starts this. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not th this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen. The gathering that will take place, of course, in Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. And gather you out of all nations, out of all countries, excuse me, and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you? A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Ye shall dwell in the land. It always has to do with the land that he promised Abraham that I gave to your fathers, F-A-T-H-E-R-S, and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. So very clearly it talks about and what, remember when he said very clearly in God's word, the whole time that Israel never understood why they were to be separated. They looked at it as being separated in a sense that they would have nothing to do with the Gentiles, but they were to bring the Gentiles back into God. And that was their problem. And he said, you never did that. Everywhere you went, instead of you profaned my name, instead of proclaiming my name. And that's important as we look at this study. Now, how does this connect then? I said it connects very clearly to Romans chapter 11. So go to Romans 11. Romans 11 is the most important chapter, maybe, to understand right division. If you can understand Romans 11, you'll understand the importance of seeing God's word rightly divided. So in Romans 11:13, of course, Paul says something very important and unique to him. He says, for I speak to you Gentiles as much as I am the apostle of Gentiles and magnify my office. Now, we also told you from last week from Romans eleven fifteen, you cannot have a reconciliation of the world until Israel is cast away. 
And that wasn't true when Christ was here on earth. That was not true in the Old Testament, of course, and that was not true at Pentecost because Peter was speaking to ye men of Judah, ye men of Israel, to all the house of Israel, I say. So who they were speaking, he was speaking to a particular group of people, God's chosen people, here back in Exodus 19. So very clearly then, though, we come to a passage that is so important to understand, that, but it, that most do not. And that's why I think Paul says what he did starting in verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Most people today, and mystery essentially means a secret, something was hidden in God since before the foundation of the world, till first revealed, to, we know, by Christ to the Apostle Paul. But not only are people ignorant, they are willfully ignorant. I've shown this people, and many others have shown this passage, and they'll look at it and not believe it. And we see the cases, what's going on with Israel now, as they see prophecy being fulfilled with everything going on in the land. But notice, let's continue. Why? Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. That's Israel today. But when we look at what we're going to look at when they become an annual, we have to look at what Israel was, and we have to look at what Israel will be. Today they're blinded. But when we look at the prophetic program being fulfilled, we'll look at what Israel was and what Israel should be, and that's why this key is so important here. And we'll look at that. Now let's continue in that passage. To those who try to spiritualize and say we are spiritual Israel, and so all Israel shall be saved. Future. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, Luke 21, Matthew 24, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And we know Jacob's name was changed to Israel. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Now, what is true today? The next verse. As concerning the gospel, what is true within them? They are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the F-A-T-H-E-R-S. For a long time when I used to read this passage years and years ago, I totally misunderstood it. There's no capital F there. And I always would, used to say it was for the God the Father's sake, but it's F-A-T-H-E-R small... Who are the fathers he's talking about? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, for those sake, for those, what I promised Abraham, what I promised Isaac, what I promised Jacob, it's for their sake that I do this. And the next verse is such a key. For the gifts of God, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, without change. What he promised Israel has to be fulfilled. So this is kind of understand that Nathan, and we're going to, I'm going to separate this for a second. And you'll see what the name Nathan means. Nathan means gift. E-L is always re -rep a representative of God in the Bible, E-L. So Nathan is the gift of God. Uh, so, Jonathan is also a gift of God. J-O, Jehovah, Nathan gift. Jonathan's name is gift of God. So, we have two important individuals who are types of Israel. They are the gift of God. And that's why he says the gifts of God are without repentance. They have to be fulfilled. Now, how do we know this is true? All we have to do is go to Hebrews chapter 6. When we go to Hebrews chapter 6, and there's a very important thing stated by God here. And I'm going to start in verse, actually, I need someone else. Uh, Bob, would you read 13 through uh, 19, please? For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, 
he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the grave, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show their heirs of promise and immu- yeah, I can't talk either. immutability in his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enter into that within the veil. When you look at the word hope, don't look at it the way we look at it today. Uh, If I would say to somebody the night before, um, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow so I can golf. Okay, I know that's not important to most people. Okay, (laughs) it should not be important to me either. Okay, but it is in this physical life. But in the hope that God used is an assurance. It's always an assurance that he talks about. The hope which assurance we have is an anchor of our soul. But what is so key about this word is the word immunability. And what the word means is, and I use this definition I found, which I think is the best, the quality that renders change and alteration impossible. Immunability, the quality that renders change and alteration impossible. So therefore, when somebody says about all those physical promises to Israel that God, Christ changed it when he was earthly, when he said, my kingdom is not of this world, he did not say my kingdom is not in this world. He said it's not of this world at that time because Satan is the ruler of this world at one time and was, when, of course, when Christ came the first time. That's why Satan had the power to say to Christ, look at all the kingdoms. I can give them all to you. And he wasn't lying. Christ didn't say you're lying. At that time, he was in control of all of them. And he will be again during that time of Jacob's trouble. So very clearly, what is the two immutable things that make all of God's promise and assurance? He made a promise, and then he swore by it by an oath. That's the two immutable things he's talking about here. A promise, and then I swear by myself that these things will be true. So all those promises to Israel have to be fulfilled. That's why the gifts and calling of God are out repentance without change. You can't change them and all of a sudden make you and I spiritual Israel, as even our fundamentalist brothers try to do. And that is not true. All those promises has to be true. And that's why today Israel is blinded. It's very hard for a Jew to come to Christ. There are a few. Even though it's Jew and Gentile alike, almost everybody saved today is a Gentile. So a Jew, in a sense, has to become a Gentile today. In the Old Testament, a Gentile to be saved had to become a Jew, a proselyte. And a man had to be circumcised and follow all the, the rules of, of, that Moses set forth. But this is the key to understanding what we're going to be talking about. Now, does Paul say something very similar about today, about God and his ability that he cannot lie? Of course he does. Go to Titus. And in Titus chapter 1, Paul tells us very clearly, starting in verse 1, Titus chapter 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope, assurance of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, what? Promised Promised before the world began. That's Paul, that's the mystery, that's the secret that he's talking about. So very clear, who hath in due times, Paul is the due time apostle, manifest his word through preaching, I love the next part, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. So very clearly Paul says the same thing. God who cannot lie made an assurance, a promise of eternal life if you or I are putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I become a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ, Galatians 3.26. Everyone on earth is not a child of God. I hear ministers and priests saying, oh, we're all children of God. 
Muslim Jew, that's absolutely true. You're only a child of God when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know this is true? Go to Ephesians chapter 2. And that is made so clear in Ephesians chapter 2. Because at one time you're the first part of this passage. Now we're the second part of this passage. Starting in verse 1. And you hath he quickened, hath made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's you before you come to Christ. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who's the prince of the power of the air? Satan. Satan. You had no choice. Everyone who's not in Christ is walking that way. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as other. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And in the next verse he talks about in ages to come what will come. Rightly dividing the word is also divided between in time past, but now and in ages to come. So very clearly, everybody who's not in Christ walks that way. We're not all children of God. We're children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, his him and his redemptive work. Now, in light of that, in that passage, what will Israel have to go through? Because what we have to understand is, Israel has to be cleansed. Ezekiel 36 makes that clear. They have not. Israel has to be planted by the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. But before that, they're going to be, have to be uprooted. And there will be a time when Israel and that land is going to be uprooted. They're not there under Christ. They're not there under Messiah, under God. They can be taken out of that land at any time. But at one time, they're going to have to root it then at the second coming of Christ. And peace will only be brought onto this earth by war and judgment. That's what Revelation 19 is all about when he comes. So very clearly here, all that time that he'll have to, they'll have to go through is, of course, in Jeremiah chapter 30, a passage we all know. And God is talking to Jeremiah very clearly in verse 1 of chapter 30. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write these all these words which I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring in the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Okay, but what has to come before? Go down to verse 7. Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, time of Israel's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, the day of the Lord, that the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke, that's the Antichrist, from off his neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no longer serve themselves of him, but they shall serve the Lord their God. And David their king, David, who is, when it talks about David the king here, who is it really talking about? Christ. It's talking about Christ. Because David means love. Nathan means gift. David, the word David means love. Christ is love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's a, a passage, of course, to Israel. There's nothing there about the crucifixion in John 3.16. I know we use that, but it's not there. But the key, there will be that kind that they're going to serve the Lord God and Christ, when it talks about there, will be raised up unto them. Okay, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when will they be planted? They have to be planted. Remember we said that? Go to Amos chapter 9 in the last verse. God's going to have to plant them. They're not going to, they didn't get there in 1948. They came there on their own. The only thing that keeps Israel today in that land is their military might. And the United States supporting them and the weapons we give them. That's what keeps them there. But eventually it won't be that way. 
because I think when the Antichrist offers them a peace, they'll take down their arms. They'll look at it and say, oh my goodness, we're going to finally have this peace. But of course we know when the Antichrist sets himself up as the Messiah in the middle and sits on the, in the temple on that seat and say, now you must worship me. But look at the last verse. Uh, look at the last two verses, 14 and 15, if somebody will read that of Amos 9, if I didn't tell you the chapter. Amos 9, 14 and 15, if somebody will read that, please. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. <coughs> they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Notice that. I will plant them. God's going to have it. He did not plant them there in 1948. The nations of England gave them that land at that time and gave them part of what, is what they call Palestine now. But I'm going to plant them. And when he does, I love the next part, they'll be pulled out, out of the land, never to be taken out again from that time. So very clearly, we see that time coming. Now, we said that Israel is always a picture of a fig tree. So we're going to look how important that is. Every man under his own vine and fig tree and why Nathaniel becomes so important to understand Israel's program. So we're going to look at some passages. We could look at numerous ones, but we're going to look at just certain passages. Go to 1 Kings 4.25. And why this is so important Because this is the reign of Solomon. And the reign of Solomon was just a prelude, a little glimpse of what the kingdom should be like. In, in Solomon's reign, they had a glimpse of what the kingdom will ultimately be like in Solomon. That's why Solomon, again, becomes a type of Christ. David is a type of Christ. There are many symbols of that, of course, in the Old Testament. But if you look at 1 Kings 4 and look at verse 20. Judah and Israel were many, as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. Where did he first say that to? About Israel will be like the sands of the seas and start. He said that to Abraham, didn't he? Clear back in Genesis. And so isn't that amazing that he says this reality, he said, is now. Judah and Israel were many, as the sands which is by the sea of Malta, eating and drinking and making merry. And notice 21, and Solomon reigned over all kingdoms. That's what Christ is going to do. From the river unto the land of the Philistines, unto the border of Egypt, they brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life. The Gentiles are going to have to come up to Israel. They're going to come up at certain days at the Feast of Tabernacles. If they don't, it says Egypt will again have those plagues put upon them that happened to them before. So very clearly you can see that. And notice about Solomon. And Solomon's provisions for one day was 30 measures of fine flour and three score measures of meal, 10 fax oxen and 20 oxen out of the pastures and 100 sheep beside hearts and roebucks and fallow deers and fatted fowl. For he had dominion over all the regions on his side of the river. And you can go on over all the kings on the side of the river. And he had peace. There's the key. And he had peace on all sides around the bottom. But here's the key. Look at the next verse. And Judah and Israel shall dwell, dwell safely. Every man under his vine and under his fig tree. From Dan even to Beersheba. All the days of Solomon. So there's the first key. Israel, every man. When they dwell safely, every man under his own vine and is under his own fig tree. Okay? The next verse we'll look at is Hosea 9.10. Now we go to the prophets. I never liked that term. Maybe I'm the only one that bothered me when people would say, you have the major prophets and the minor prophets. They're all prophets of God. Just because they don't have the volumes of the book 
Hosea is just as much a prophet as Isaiah and Ezekiel. But they have a tendency, I've heard that so much. Well, we have the major prophets Isaac, of Isaiah, <laughs> Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Then we have the minor prophets of Joel and Hosea. No, they're all major prophets of God. But look at the verse in verse 10 of Hosea 9. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers, here's the key, F-A-T-H-E-R-S. Remember what we saw there in Romans 11? As the first ripe in the fig tree at their first time. But they went to Belpior and separated themselves into their shame, and their abominations were according as they loved. But the key to that verse that I took you to was what? I saw your fathers, F-A-T-H-E-R-S, Abraham Isaac, as the first stripe, first ripe, excuse me, in the fig tree at her first time. Now, the most important passage that I'm going to take you to now is Micah. Before we get to John 1.49. So in Micah chapter 4, I was only going to read a few, but I'm going to read you 1 through 6. I was going to start in 4, but let's get the total background. Micah chapter 4 and verses 1 through 6. Please follow carefully. It's such an important passage. But in the last days, so we know the reference, when it has to go, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord, and any time you see that word mountain lots of times, you can substitute what? Kingdom. Yeah. I love that. Do, do you see why Christ went up in the mountain and set himself before he gave the Sermon on the Mount? He sets himself as a king in his kingdom. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. It has nothing to do with you and I. Shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come, there's the key, and say, come and let us go up into the mountain or the kingdom of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his path. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Anybody know the passage where it's just the opposite? In the book of Joel. He tells the nations before he comes, I think God's going to laugh. Prepare yourself. Take all those plowshares and put them into swords. Take, <laughs> take all your, your pruning hooks and put them in spears. Get yourself ready. There's going to be a great battle here, as he talks about in Joel. But I think it's almost a laughable thing, but he tells the nation to prepare themselves. But in Isaiah, Isaiah says the same thing that Micah says. When Christ rules, there'll be no war anymore. And then he says, take all your sword, put them in a plaza. They're no good to you anymore. Because there'll be no war any going. I love that. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation. Neither shall we learn war anymore. But they shall, see, I love this, here it is again. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. For all people will walk, everyone in the name of his God. He will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that holdeth, and I will gather her that is driven and her that I have afflicted. I will, I will, I will. I meant to say that in Ezekiel. I did not mention that. Eleven times God says, I will, I will, I will. One time he says, I shall. It all has to be that God's going to do it for Israel. Israel cannot do it for themselves. So very clear, that passage in Micah is so important. But one more passage. Go to Zechariah. And in Zechariah chapter 3, we know when all this will take place because he makes it very clear in verse 10. Zechariah 3 and verse 10. Read, listen very carefully. In that day, what day? The day of the Lord. Saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. So very clearly we see the importance of Every man at some time will be under his own vine and his own fig tree. 
And that's why we get to this passage here. Go to John chapter 1. People don't want to study the Word of God. They use it maybe as a reference book, and they talk about it as a devotional book. But the Word of God is supposed to be studied, and that's what we're doing. To study it means then you're going to understand it if you put everything in perspective. If you understand the difference between law and grace, between prophecy and mystery, between the program to Israel. Because when we're dealing with Israel, it's a national redemption. Today we're dealing with individual redemption, whether you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. But with Israel, it's always a national redemption. They're going to redeem this nation. That's why when Daniel went in and prayed, do you know anybody prays today? He said to pray for his sin and also what? For the nation. When it came that time and Daniel knew he could not pray that prayer until the 70 years were fulfilled that Israel failed to, uh, to fulfill in 490 years. What they failed to do is to rest the Sabbath every seventh year. And so for 490 years, God was patient. He was long-suffering. But he said, no, no more, Israel. Now you're going to have your Sabbath for 70 years. I'm taking you out of the land, and the land will be rested for 70 consecutive years. Daniel knew not to pray that prayer that he prayed there in Daniel 9 until that 70 years was fulfilled. Then they could return to the land. That's another subject. Go to John chapter 1, and let's look at this passage. Such an important passage that Israel has to understand. Today, Israel is bar Jesus. And remember, do you remember when it said Israel's sins were filled up? Oh, everybody's looking at me crazily. It says Israel's sins were filled up when they failed to allow the Gentiles to hear the message. And Bar Jesus, of course, is a totally exaggerated. He would not let Sergius Paulus. He didn't want him to hear the message. So today, Israel is Bar Jesus. Israel eventually will be Nathaniel. They will be Jonathan. But let's look at this passage and see how beautiful it is. Starting in verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find a Philip and said unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, a city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did speak, did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. I love that. <laughs> Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, here's the key, behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no gal. In bar Jesus, Israel has gal today, totally. But Israel has to be exactly what is saying there. Every Israelite will have to be a person without gal. And Nathanael is that type of that. Look at it again. Behold an Israelite, he says to Nathanael, indeed in whom is no gal. Let's continue. Nathanael saith him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said to them, Before that Philip called thee, here's the key, when thou wast what? Under the fig tree I see thee. That's why Nathanael becomes what Mike is talking about what 1 Kings is talking about when they were under Solomon, what Zechariah is talking about. So this answer is very, all Israel will have to be a Nathaniel. They'll have to be an Israelite without Gal to have their kingdom. And that's not true, of course, today. Now, to have that, they'll have to be coming under the Messiah. But we'll see what Israel will have to do. They will have to say exactly what Nathaniel says here as a nation. Let's continue. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, here's the key. What does he say? Thou art the Son of God, the King of Israel. Every Israelite in that nation is going to have to say that. To become an Israelite without God, they're going to do what they refuse to do. When they said, what should, when, uh, when Pilate said, what, what should I do this with Jesus, which is called your Christ? They said, crucify him. We don't want him. Our king is Caesar. We don't want him. When they stoned Stephen, we don't want him. We don't want the Son of Man to come and rule over us. 
But very clearly here, I love that part. Rabbi, thou art the son of God, and thou art the king of Israel. Every Israeli will have to say that. Every Israeli will have to be without God. Every Israelite will have to be a Nathaniel, which is a gift of God. And that's why Romans 11 is so important to us to understand. That is not true of Israel today. Today they're blinded. But to understand all of prophecy, you have to understand what Israel was, and you have to understand what Israel will be. That's why a foretaste of the kingdom they got in Solomon's reign. Every Jew was under his own vine and is under his own fig tree. That will happen again, but not until every, until every Israelite becomes a Nathaniel. It is so beautiful to see. Now, what is so important about that? Let's go to John 11 as we start to close. You always think you don't have enough prepared, and then you realize when time is out that you've got another 50 minutes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> if I'm not with the Lord, yes, yeah, okay. But why is it so important to understand in Romans chapter 11 the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, without any change? And he makes that very clear. Today they're blind, but why that is so important is we have to go, well, Israel is going to be planted. They're going to have their national redemption when Christ sits on David's throne. But the key to remember is what he said in the last part of verse 29. Oh, Romans 11. Did I say that? I apologize. What did I say? That's a good passage, but it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Forgive me, I'm getting old. Notice verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. That's what right division, understand what Israel is today. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Why is that so important? F-A-T-H-E-R-S, small f. We just read that in the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all those promises. Why is this so important? Well, the first thing here is go to Exodus chapter 2. And in Exodus chapter 2, helps us to understand that passage. Don't be so slow, Galen. Get there. And what we understand, why did God take Israel out of Egypt and out of Egyptian bondage? And that's why Romans 11 is so important. Think of that. Why did God take Israel out of Egypt and out of bondage? He answers that in 23 through 25. Let's read, if somebody will read that, anyone who loves to read, Exodus 2, 23 through 25. came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Isn't that amazing? See how Romans 11 comes in to, to fill? Because of the Father's sake. Why did he bring them out of Egypt? Because of the Father's. F-A-T-H-E, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Go to Exodus ch chapter 12. I hope I have the right passage because I didn't write this down. So I'll apologize if I'm... Mm -mm, see. No, Exodus 32. Thank you, Lord. Exodus chapter 32. And verse 13. Why did God not kill all of Israel when they made that golden calf. Think of that. And now let's read that in verse 18. Remembering Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, another name for Jacob, thy servants to whom thou swearest by thy own self. That's what Moses is saying. Remember that, Lord. 
and saith unto them, I will multiply your seeds of the stars of heaven, and all this land which I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall adhere forever. The reason all of Israel, God wanted to, he was so upset, he wanted to kill them all. Moses says to the Lord, remember, that promises that you made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So very clearly, you can see in God's word how important that passage is that Romans talks about. That all the gifts of God are without repentance, and it's for the Father's sake. The promise and the oath, two th immutable things, a promise and an oath that he made to Abraham, Abra Isaac, and Jacob. By two immutable things, God cannot lie. The quality that renders change and alteration impossible, as Hebrews talks about. So when we look at God's word, look at it very clearly that when we look at what Israel has to be, what a beautiful time, and Nathaniel, break it down, gift to God. And the first time Nathan is going to take you there is in 2 Samuel 7, as Nathan was a prophet of God. He's the one, that, remember when um, David, real quickly, took one of Bathsheba, and the way he could get Bathsheba was to send what? Uriah the Hittite out to battle knowing he's going to be killed. So Nathan comes to him as a prophet and tells him a little story, doesn't he? And he said, boy, there was this rich man. And he had all these sheep. And there was this little poor man who had one ewe lamb. And when it came to that point uh, there, he said, when a stranger, a traveler came and he wanted to dress it up and have this lamb for them to eat, Instead, he took that one little lamb of that poor man and he dressed that up and killed it and gave it to the traveler. And Nathan, and boy, David's anger. What should happen to that man? He should die. And he said, and then he should give back fourfold. And then what does Nathan say? You are the man because you had all these wives I gave you in the master's house. The Hittite, you had one, and you took that one. You're the one. And because, but Abraham, Nathan, <laughs> David did not die, but because of his sin, what happened to that child that was produced? It died, and he was in mourning. But then there's another child going to come forth of the line of David, of, uh, of, uh, David, of the line of Christ, and of course that is what? Solomon. So very clearly, we're so thankful that we understand what a beautiful thing. This is not to us, but look what Israel has to look forward to. They're going to have to be a Nathaniel, a gift of God, an Israelite without Gal. Every man under his own vine and fig tree, and the fig tree is always a type of Israel. Father, we just thank you and praise you for this wonderful world. Today, Israel has been blinded set aside for a season, for a time. And now it's Jew and Gentile alike. And it's all individual salvation, coming to the Lord Jesus Christ by his redemptive work at Calvary. But there's a time when Israel is going to be saved as a national redemption, when Israel becomes a Nathaniel, a gift of God, an Israelite without God. Today they're bar Jesus. In the future, they'll be Nathaniel. We have to look in the prophecy of what Israel was, and what Israel will be. Today, Israel has been blinded. So the Jew and Gentile alike come to faith, simply becoming a child of God by faith in Christ and his redemptive first. We just thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen.